Here I've dreamed up three cross sections, uh, which all have the same height. They're all half an inch tall, and they all have the same area, uh, which is 0.13 inches squared. I have just a really simple rectangular beam, a shape that looks kind of like an I-beam, and then a shape that's actually a hollow pipe. And so I went into OnShape, which is a free online CAD uh, program, and I've drafted up these three uh, different shapes, and then using a 3D printer, I printed them using a flexi material called Ninja Flex. So here I have the three beams that I printed on the 3D printer. I have the square, or the rectangular shape. You can tell this is nice and flexy. It's printed out of that Ninja Flex. The, uh, well, the I-beam shape. And the circular shape. And so what I might want to do is I might want to measure the flexiness of these materials. Remember, they all have the same height and the same cross-sectional area. So the, the cross-sectional area is the same on each one. We've already shown that calculation. And they all have the same height. And hopefully what was obvious from, from looking at the deflections is that the beams, even though they have the same height and the same cross-sectional area, they have, they have different amounts of flexiness. Um, it takes a different amount of force to cause the same deflection in each beam. This is obvious if you've ever played with a popsicle stick before. This, this beam is easier to bend around its narrow axis than over its wide axis. Um, and hopefully you've seen an I-beam before used as a structural component. Um, they, they usually are very uh, stiff and hard to bend. Um, pipes are also a nice uh, you know, nice thing to use in columns. Um, you'll see them a lot as columns. They have uh, nice aesthetics in construction. So if the, if the bendiness of the beam is not a function, or the stiffness of the beam is not a function of its height or its area, then we need to know what, how we can calculate the, what, how these different shapes affect the stiffness of the beam. And the answer lies in the area, area moment of inertia. Now in physics, when we think of inertia, we think of uh, resistance to motion. And we think of moment of inertia, we think of especially resistance to rotational motion um, or motion around an axis. If I go back to the cross section on my shape and if I look at just one slice of my rectangular beam here, when that beam is bending, what's actually happening is it's little, the little slices of the beam are rotating, in this case, around the x-axis um, or the axis um, that goes through its, its center. Um, and so those different cross sections are, are rotating around that axis as I bend the beam. And a beam that has a greater resistance to rotation around that axis will be stiffer, will be less likely to bend, it will take more force to bend. So let's take a look at how we can calculate the area moment of inertia. Um, I have these two equations here and um, for the area moment inertia defined uh, by calculus. We can, we can draw out what these mean a little bit clearer here. Um, so let's start by looking at dA. What is dA? So that's a, a differential area element. So I'll draw an area element um, that we might want to look at and we'll call this dA. Well, we could redefine this, we could say this is some infinitely small area, so it's some small uh, slice dy um, by, we'll call the width base. So we're going we're gonna to rename this thing, we're going to call this the, the base, and we're going to call, we're going to call this the height. Okay, so we could rewrite this, this integral now, we could say this is the integral, and let's, let's keep this, this is our x-axis, uh, and we're looking at the rotation around the x-axis of this shape. And so we uh, need to complete this integral for the entire shape. So we're going to go from uh, negative h over 2 to h over 2. Those are the, the bounds of our integral. And we need to integrate. It says y squared. And then dA. We said dA is, gonna, is equal to dA is equal to base times dy. So y squared base dy. Okay, so now this looks like something that's, that's easier to integrate, something that's familiar from calculus. We could rewrite this, um, we, could, we could solve this integral. We have y squared b dy. b is a constant, so we end up with y cubed b over 
3 evaluated from negative h over 2 to h over 2. And if, if we evaluate this integral, we end up with 1 12th base times height cubed, which is great. That's actually if we if we look at the um, a table, this is just a table on Wikipedia of a list of area moments of inertia. We can see here that our uh, our formula that we derived uh, matches uh, that for a rectangle. Uh, noting that this is the, where the axis of rotation is around the center of the rectangle. If we move the axis of rotation, uh, then we get a different answer. We get uh, base height cubed over 3. And it says this is a result of the parallel axis theorem. And, and we'll see what that means in just a second. But first we need to finish calculating our area moment of inertia. So we said that the uh, area moment of inertia around the x-axis is equal to 1 12th base height cubed. So then if we plug in our uh, base, um, so we have 1 1 12th. We plug in our base of 0 0.26 inches and our height of 0 0.5 inches cubed. We'll get 0 0.0027 inches to the fourth power. Okay, so that gives us a, a measure of the area moment of inertia, and we'll compare that to the other two beams in just a second. But real quick, I wanted to say, well, what happened? Right now we have the rotation around the x-axis. What happens if we wanted to move this uh, axis down to the bottom uh, over here. We wanted the, our axis of rotation to be at the bottom. Well, uh, now we've set our, our, we can move our x origin down here. We uh, get rid of uh, this negative limit and our po positive limit would just be h. And so our, our integral, it changes. Now we're integrating from 0 to h. Our area element uh, stays the same. dy times b is dA. And, and so what we get is we get um, we change the the limits of our integration from zero to h, and we're left with one third bh cubed, which is the same as we saw on the previous table. But there's another way to do that. That other way to move integral or to move the axis of our rotation is called the parallel axis theorem. And this, here's a definition. So if I have a, a starting uh, moment of inertia and I want to move it some distance y, um, then I just need to know the area of the shape and that distance. So we, ha so we had our original axis of rotation up here. We, we, we'll call that ix prime. And if you remember, that was 1 12th base height cubed. Um, and then the only other thing we need to know if we want to move it down to this new axis of rotation, then we can say, well, ix is equal to ix prime plus the area. Um, so in this case, the area is base times height times the distance in the y direction squared. And in this case, this distance is just removing it down h over 2. Actually, we're moving it negative h over 2, but because it's squared, it doesn't matter. So h over 2 squared. And so if we replace um, ix prime with our, our moment of inertia around our original axis, we have a formula. And this, this simplifies down to be the same as what we calculated up here, 1 third base height cubed. And so the reason that we care about the parallel axis theorem is it allows us to find the area moment of inertia of more complicated shapes like the I-beam that uh, we decided was, was a pretty stiff shape even though it has the same cross-sectional area and height. So let's look at the area moment of inertia of this I-beam. Well, this is going to be easiest if we divide this up into three, three shapes. We'll have a rectangle up at the top because we already know how to calculate the area moment of inertia of the rectangle. We'll have uh, the middle rectangle, which I'll draw by this blue area here, and then we'll have a bottom rectangle, 
which is denoted by this red area here. Now, the blue rectangle is easy. Uh, the axis of rotation that we're looking at is, is right along at this beam's center. Uh, that's what we want to know, uh, how the shape resists rotation around that axis. Um, and for the blue rectangle, we've already defined that as being 1 12th uh, base times height, or 0.1 inches times 0.3 inches cubed. That's the area moment of inertia of that, that center rectangle, and that's equal to 0 0.00075 inches to the fourth. Um, now this green rectangle might be less obvious. Um, we know how to calculate its uh, rotation around its centroid. That's easy. That's 1 12 times its base, which is 0 0.5 inches, times its height, which is 0 0.1 inch cubed, but that's around its uh, centroid. The axis of rotation is way down here, so we need to move uh, that down. So that's going to be plus its area, which is 0 0.1 inch times 0 0.5 inch times the distance we're moving. In this case, that distance is, is 0.2 inches. Um, and so that means that the the total area moment of inertia for this green shape is 0 0.00204 inches to the fourth. And we could do the same for the red. Um, the red shape actually is the exact same as the green shape. The, 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 so its area moment of inertia is exactly the same, but then we want to move that rotation up to the axis of rotation of the entire shape, or the centroid of the tire shape. So um, we have to again add its area. 0.1 inch times 0.5 inch times the distance we're moving it, which is 0 0.2 inches. And we get the same answer for this one, 0 0.0024, 0 0.00204 inches to the fourth. Now, if we want to find the total area moment of inertia of this composite I-beam um, around the x-axis, uh, we can just add up these three numbers and we get that the total area moment of inertia is 0 0.0048 inches to the fourth. Now if you compare that back to the area moment of inertia that we calculated for the, the square beam, uh, this is almost double. So this, this beam has almost twice the resistance to rotation as that square beam, just as a function of we took some, uh, some material from the middle here and we moved it out away from the axis of the rotation, which is going to cause more resistance to rotation and therefore make a stiffer beam. And real quickly, I also just calculated the area moment inertia for the circular shape by taking the area moment inertia of the outer shape and then subtracting the inner circle. And I got this, the area moment inertia for that, that shape too. So this is going to be a useful tool for us because it shows up in all sorts of formulas. It shows up uh, in the beam bending formulas. It shows up when we're trying to calculate uh, the bending stress in a beam. Um, it's going to show up in our buckling formula when we're trying to calculate the maximum load, the critical load before a beam will buckle um, or a column will buckle. So uh, th this is going to be really useful moving forward is to be able to, to look at different shapes and know how uh, the shape of the beam affects its stiffness. Thank you so much. For watching the screencast if you liked it uh, you know be sure to to uh, like the video or uh, to subscribe down below uh, and always feel free to ask questions in the comments below